It's just about 1 a.m. and I'm still in the garage. I've been here for hours. Um, I've been trying to get the headlight and the corner light to align properly with the fender. And I got hours and hours invested in this whole front end because of the accident uh, that the previous owner was in. <sighs> so much work, it's crazy. Little tiny fender bender and things were so far out of whack. Uh, right now, I just took this off of the hood and I'm trying to adjust it it was completely seized so uh, put the torch to it and I'm just at the point where I broke it free so got it moving now now I can adjust the height of the hood while it's latched on all right so I came out yesterday and the CRX would not start it sounded like a dead battery all right no problem right grab my jump starter put it on and go to crank the car, same exact noise. Sounds like a dead battery, even with the jump starter on it. Okay, so I had been messing with the front end recently, and then I remembered that uh, I actually broke the ground strap going to the engine. You can see how corroded it is. So I whipped up something yesterday, very quick and dirty, which was this one right here. Just, you know. All right. Put the jump starter back on the car. Car starts up. Ran for about five seconds. It shut off on its own, and then it turned into a crank no start. And by the way, I just made this one today. I know it's not the correct thickness, but it's all I got for now. And all I had was red wire, so it's going to have to do for now. And I came out here, started testing things, realized we had no spark. So that's why I got my clamp right here. I was starting to check things. My first uh, suspicion was the ignition coil. And then I realized we also had no fuel pump. Okay, so we got no fuel pump, no spark. So that led me in a different direction. Did a quick bypass test of the main relay and the car started right up. So the main relay went bad. And it's funny because when I bought the car, the previous owner said he just had the same issue. He replaced the main relay uh, but when I went in there, the main relay looked old. It looked like an original unit. So I'm not going to say he's lying. I don't believe he was lying. I think he just probably maybe went to a salvage yard and got a used main relay. But that one has failed now. So now I need to go get a new one. But that's where we're at. All right. So the people of the E-Web are going to be <laughs> talking crap to me of all people, right? But, um. Yeah, I shot the parts cannon at the car instead of diagnosing it properly. So I went to an auto zone and picked up a main relay, put it in, and the car still would not start. Okay, so what I was doing is when I bypassed it, I was supplying power to wires that are supposed to get power from somewhere else. But because I was bypassing it, that's why the car was able to start. But, you know, I was being lazy. I didn't want to diagnose it, and I just shot the parts cannon at it. I'm not worried about it because I could keep this or take it back. I'm not worried about it. But, you know, at this point, I had no choice but to start checking and find out what's going on here. So we got power here, which is always there at all times. This one right here comes from the ignition. Right now it's grounded, but once you turn the key, you get power there. And that's where I was missing power. So you start tracing things back, and it led me to a blown out fuse. And the fuse that was blown out, let's see if I can get this glare out of here. Was this 10 amp fuse? And it was this one right here, alternator solenoid valve. Not really sure what that is. I know what alternator is, but solenoid valve, eh, whatever. Anyway, this fuse also supplies power to that wire I just tested. Um, I'm not sure why it blew. Obviously, it should not just blow for no reason. But at least we got the no start figured out. And then if this turns into a problem where it keeps blowing a the fuse, then we could start chasing this. I just finished making these aluminum brackets for the lock actuator. Now they're kind of just a rough cut. I still got to round them off and make them look halfway decent. But you can see how solid this thing is. It doesn't really move compared to the cheap brackets that are supplied with the kit. And it does clear the window. So I'm going to roll the window up and down. No issues at all. And, uh,.
just put a new overflow tank on the CRX because this one, like an idiot, I took it off and I set it down there when I was messing with the whole headlight thing and I forgot it was down there so when I turned the car on the pulley started rubbing on it and it made a hole right there it's hard to see but there's a hole uh, so I had no intentions of replacing this because it did its job and now I have to buy this little cheapo one off of uh, eBay eh, it works I guess alright so just uh, one more job for tonight obviously from brakes um, 2015 Nissan Versa uh, pretty much the same exact car I have. The only thing different is it's not a hatchback. But these are, well, I'm not sure, but I'm just going to assume these are the original pads and rotors that came on the car. You can see they're pretty rough. They got a big old lip on the edge. Pads are pretty worn down, making noise. And uh, you look at my brakes, which are still in the original 2015 also. And everything looks brand new still because I don't really drive my car. But we're going to get this one all sorted. I'm in a 2011 Nissan Versa and I'm putting a stereo in it for the customer okay so we are removing this Pioneer single DIN and customer wants to upgrade to a double DIN primarily he said because of Bluetooth here's the thing he said that first Pioneer radio was installed by Best Buy and he said they charged him an arm and a leg okay look at this for this kit, he went out and bought the adapter kit, which is supposed to plug into the original harness of the car and blah, 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 right? Doing it the right way. I hate when I see the original wires on a car cut. So he paid good money at Best Buy, and this is what they did. They didn't even bother to use a kit. They just cut his original wires. So I got the new stereo plugged in, and I'm just testing to be 100% sure that that harness is going to work with this radio. And... It looks like it is. Yep, it's already up and running. So, pretty nice looking radio. The only thing I don't like about it is it's not face off. Around here, uh, cars are get prone to getting broken into because of stereos. So, that's a downside to it. But it looks nice and it seems to be working. Alright, so short update. I just had a talk with the owner and he was not happy about this he said because he specifically he said he remembers that he paid Best Buy for them to use the adapter harness so that there is no cutting of a wire of the wires necessary yet they still did it so he's not happy about that and also this kit you know to be able to install a new radio in the Versa it claims it's for a single and a double din and they give you everything for the single din but for the double din it says reuse your original brackets off of your stereo okay so luckily the owner still had the original stereo with him and I could retrieve the brackets off of it but had it not been for this you are not going to be able to install the new radio in this car at least it doubled in so to me that's kind of BS advertising saying that it's for a single and a double because if it doesn't include the bracket then you shouldn't advertise for it if that makes sense I'm doing a uh front wheel bearing on an 03 Ford Escape um, it's one of those cars where I did not look at it they did not, did not diagnose it they just talked to me over the phone and told me what it needs and what they want me to replace so they bring it over and uh, yeah the wheel bearing is worn out but she's hearing all this noise and I noticed the brake pedal was all the way to the floor the front brake pads were recently done right yet the brake pedal was all the way to the floor it's the rear drum brakes the shoes are shot uh, there's excessive play so you could hear all the springs clunking around every time you hit the, the brake pedal and that's why the brake pedal just goes all the way to the floor because you're losing all your uh, pedal travel in the rear drums um, but also doing a wheel bearing you know I use a slide hammer to pull the hub out 
and pretty much like half the bearing came out with it. If you look at the snap ring, it's so uh, corroded that it's just kind of flush, so it doesn't really hold the bearing in. So I just sent the owner off to get a new snap ring, and um, recently she had her outer tie rods done by her cousin, and you know you shake this and there's still a little bit of play here so it makes you think the inner tie rods are bad but really there is a gap here between the nut and the outer tie rod and when you shake it back and forth you can see it moving the jam nut isn't even tight up against the outer tie rod yep it's just a bunch of crap here but well, I guess that's what happens when uh, you let your family fix your car right what you pay is what you get by the way, she said she tried contacting her cousin after he did, you know, front brake pads and tie rods. She says she can't get a hold of him ever since <laughs> he did the work. I'm like, wow, really? Yep, that's a family member right there. All right, so I'm just about done with this wheel bearing. Um, that outer tie rod, simply just went at it with a wrench, tighten it up. It's It wasn't even nowhere near tight. It's almost like he just forgot to tighten it. Um, Yep, that'll be it for this one. Uh, she's going to have to come back to get the rear brakes done. Alright, so not every day is working on cars. I'm actually on top of my garage right now. We are cutting uh, just some, some of these bigger branches off of these trees that are just really, you know, causing problems. So I'm using this, I don't even know what the heck this is. It's like a little mini chainsaw. But as you can see, I've already cut off a big chunk of things. So just a few more things to do and I'll be set up here all right and I'm just about done here um, I feel like I've taken down pretty much a whole tree <laughs> there's all of this right here there's some on the side of the garage and I even ended up throwing some of them in the yard on so on that side of the garage so there's a lot more than just this right here but I'm pretty much done here I don't feel like falling off of a roof today once again I'm working on my neighbors Dodge Durango uh, today we're doing inner and outer tie rods. As you can see, I'm pretty much done on this side. So I'm just going to go ahead and knock out the other side, and this one should be all set. Uh, that's not good. And a quick look at the other side of the car. And it's getting spark plugs. Now, this is such a pain in the ass. I've been at it for a while, and so far I've only removed one spark plug. Only 15 more to go. That's right, 16 spark plugs in this piece of crap. So, here's one I removed. You can see the gap on it. And then here's the gap of what a new plug looks like. Uh, the customer is having issues with random misfires mainly at uh, higher speeds higher rpm at idle for the most part it's okay it's when you really get on it so you can see how worn out the plugs are uh, let's keep going forward let's see how this uh, job turns out to be kind of seems like a nightmare at this point and here's another issue which is uh, different spark plugs I just pulled out a Bosch platinum plug the first one I pulled out was a Champion. Now I think OEM for this uh, engine is Champion. Look at that. See a different plug types at the end. I hate this. All right. Yeah. That's not. Um, I don't. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why only some plugs were changed, and you should have put the correct ones in here. But whatever, let's see how many uh, plugs were changed. Now if we look closely right here on the piece of plastic that holds all the wires together. Let me get this focus. You can see that right there is signs that the wires were arcing. So basically an open in the wires. See all the white stuff right there burning the plastic. So, uh, yep spark plugs that don't belong and old wires that's why there's misfires on this thing it is now the next day 
it's not that it's taking me that long it's just I got caught up doing other things yesterday so everything on the right side of that right side of the car okay is done so now I'm on this bank and I decided to start on the furthest spark plugs which would normally be like the hardest one to get to my surprise uh, this is what came out of it okay so this tells me uh, basically whoever came in here last time to do a tune-up or change the spark plugs they only change the ones that do not have coils on them okay so essentially you could say they changed the easier ones and also not only did they just do that but they did not bother to change the one furthest in the back I'm guessing because it was the hardest to reach difficult to get out and I can't really thread in the new one it's threading in there's nothing wrong with the threads on the head it's just they're just so full of junk so I end up grabbing one of the old spark plugs that I pulled out and as you can see I just cut some reliefs in it on both sides and that just kind of acts as a thread chaser I already ran it in once and you can see all the junk that's caught inside of here so just gonna keep at it I just finished taking the Durango out for a test drive and it's running nice and smooth I can't hear or feel any misfires no codes present and uh, yeah it seems to be pretty good now another thing I noticed is uh, not so long ago I did the inner and outer tie rods on this thing on both sides and uh, customer has not taken it in for a wheel alignment yet but this thing is like dead on straight like the steering wheel is perfectly straight it'll go straight down the road so uh, you know high five to myself because I did a pretty good job at measuring the tie rods although he should still take it in for a wheel alignment no excuses it should still go in but pretty set here all good and uh, that's it I am back again with my mom's ATHR uh, last time she was here to get the rear drums I'm sure you guys saw that video, video already but uh, we cannot get the rear left side done because I couldn't get the drum off so it's why I went ahead and ordered a new drum because I knew we were going to be cutting into this one so I made the cut and right there I could see the little wheel I have to adjust down inside of there so we'll get this drum off soon uh, it just seems way faster to just cut a hole in it than to you know spend 20 minutes um, trying to get into the axis hole and trying to get it adjusted especially when those things are just uh, seized in place for, you know from never being moved for so long it's just it just seems faster like this all right I'm just about done here doing the drum on this side of the car got the new drum here that's the first time I tried putting uh, tape on the shoes to protect them while you're installing them and I like it it's uh you know, it takes up just a second of your time and keeps the new shoes looking brand new. There you go. Ready to go back together and get adjusted. My friend just dropped off his Honda Odyssey. Uh, first thing is we have to do spark plugs second thing is valve cover gaskets because it's leaking oil like crazy and there's oil getting into the spark plug area another issue is the steering wheel has a lot of play okay the car's turned off right now there's a lot of play and it does not translate into the rack and pinion so if we come down here one of the first things i decided to look at was this right here get this key out of here but you could see we're missing a bolt it should be right here if you look down boom there goes the bolt now this car recently well, I want to say maybe a few months ago had the transmission replaced I'm gonna assume the rack and pinion or the subframe was dropped in order to get the rack and pinion out yeah so that sucks okay so I decided before I put the bolt in that's missing I'm gonna go ahead and remove the bolt that is installed so I could put some thread locker on it and it's not even tight look no effort at all to turn it 
Oh, I hate this freaking ratchet. Every time this happens to me, I always wish I bought it with the, with the locking head instead of just like the regular flex head. It just kills me. So annoying. Now I'm just ranting. Anyway, as you can see, the bolt is just turning. It took no force at all to get it to start moving. So, I don't know. I'm going to have to say uh, this is not a case of where the bolts just back themselves out i think someone clearly just forgot to tighten them or i don't know i really don't know what's going on point is they're not tight and there we go both of the bolts are in everything has blue thread locker on it got the van running right now there's a little bit of movement but that's perfectly normal definitely no clunking like there was before and you can feel a direct connection to the rack and pinion now yeah that's crazy that could have been or I mean that was a crazy safety hazard <sighs> can you imagine that slip joint just uh, not gripping when you go to turn and you end up crashing yeah crazy dangerous but uh it's fixed now when I was pulling his van into the garage uh, I noticed uh, just any little bump you hit and that's crazy annoying so I decided just pull the panel off and tighten this up and just kind of fix this problem here all right so I just took this top cover off of the intake plenum if that's what you want to call it the first thing I notice is this o-ring look at that right there see that to me that yells vacuum leak and there's more signs of it over here. You can see how the gasket just isn't. Or maybe that's just me. Yeah, it's probably just me. Yeah, but this is the biggest concern right here. It's also going to need a new intake air tube thingamajiggle. You can see the clamp would normally sit right there. See, the, the rubber is completely separated from from the rest of the tube going to the air filter. Making some good progress here. Just got the three rear coils out and you can see the one on the right is uh, dry. The one on the left has some oil in it. The one in the center is completely soaked, I'd say to about right here. So that's why we're coming in here to change these uh, valve cover gaskets. So far the job's going pretty smooth. All right, so both of the valve covers are off of uh, the van. Now well, here's something that did not take long for me to notice. Look at the way these were installed like this, okay? And look at the way these are installed. This is the front cover. It was not leaking. The back one was leaking like crazy. So someone's been in here, obviously, and they installed these little grommets, gaskets, whatever you want to call them. They installed them upside down. That's why they're leaking. I'm almost uh, done with this Honda Odyssey. Everything is put back together. Uh, the car runs just fine. And time will tell if the valve cover gaskets fix the leak. Sometimes it's kind of iffy with this thing since it's so hard to see the rear gasket. But the only thing left to do is an oil change. So getting that ready right now. I'm back in this Nissan Versa, the one I just put the radio in a few days ago. And the customer says that uh, the airbag light has been on ever since I installed a new radio. I thought that was weird. But then, uh, you know, pull it up here, checking the code that we have, and it says passenger AB indicator. I thought about it, and of course, I had this unplugged while I plugged in a radio and turned the key on so I could check the radio. So what it's doing is it's throwing a code because it sensed that this was unplugged when uh, when the car was turned on. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, clear the code and that light should go away. I cleared the code, let's turn it back on. And there we go, it's off before it would stay on all the time. As soon as you turn the car on, it was on. And that's it. So uh, it's something that I overlooked. I didn't notice it when I was working on the car and I should have uh, paid attention to that. 
unless it doesn't matter it's my neighbor so it literally takes uh you know 30 seconds to go get the keys from him but now it's all set i'm in a chevy malibu like 2005 and uh another radio install it sucks because all this has to come apart but uh, the, at least the installation kit was simple enough to put together. So it looks like it's just going to bolt in yeah, just about right there somewhere. So, so far so good. We did get an adapter harness and I already checked it. It does plug in. So I think the worst part about this job is uh, taking apart all the panels. So I opened up the new radio and I saw this little remote. First thing that came to mind is exhibit. I was like, what is this? An episode of Pin My Ride? <laughs> yep, just my luck. The radio is missing the harness that plugs into the back. I searched everywhere. At first, I was like, did I drop it somewhere? Nope. It was not included in the box. This is crazy. She bought the radio brand new. So we have the adapter harness to plug from the car into the radio, but the original harness for the radio is not here. Check the boxes and everything, checked all the bags. This really blows because this was a lot of work. Short update, we did end up getting the correct adapter for the radio. A customer had to go to Walmart and buy another radio like this to get the adapter out of it. But she bought the radio that only works off of Bluetooth and it did not have a CD player. So it was only, it was like half the size of this radio. Um, and it was like dirt cheap. I think she only paid like $22 for the complete radio. So it's like the harness alone was worth the $22. Anyways, we're going to go ahead and use the unit with the CD player. And now we have the harness and get everything put inside this car. Should be set. Alright, so I'm pretty much done here. As you can see, the radio is turned on. It's working. Um, here's the wire harness, and everything is uh, soldered and heat shrinked, and then wrapped up in electrical tape. Now, there is one separate wire you have to run on these cars, which you can see it right here. I have a separate red wire coming out of the loom, and it's basically tapping right here, and it's just basically any power source on the car that only has power when the car is running because if you tie the yellow and the red together and just tap it into the one power source that comes out the harness then the radio is going to be on even when you take the key out and it'll drain the battery so you got to make sure you wire up a separate wire for the power source and i already tested it everything works fine how it should now the customer has a radio that's working here I have a Dodge Calibridge here for two things. Uh, the first thing is they want to put brake pads on it, but don't let that throw you off. It's, the car doesn't get driven much, that's why there's so much rust on the rotor. But uh, at first I was just going to put the pads on like they want, but looking at the condition of the rotors you can tell they're pretty rusty and crusty. But um, you know, it's eh, whatever, right? Then you take off the back pad and then you can see this really weird pattern on it. So you look at the back side of the rotor and maybe like a quarter inch of that rotor where it should be smooth, where this pad should be touching exactly right here, but it's just full of rust. So I think I'm going to turn down this uh, pad job and tell them they need to get rotors. It's uh, overheating. Uh, she said uh, someone at her job told her that it was leaking antifreeze. And they told her it was the lower radiator hose. All right. So right now I just filled up the system with water because there's absolutely no coolant in it. And I don't know where this is going to go, so I'm not going to waste coolant on it. But filled it up with water, and it seems to be holding pressure. So I'm going to give it like another 5, 10 minutes, see if it drops. And uh, I'll keep you guys updated. All right, so it's been about a half hour. And that really has not moved at all. So the next step is I'm going to wait till tomorrow and I'm actually going to let the car warm up and idle for a while and see if we have any coolant leaks while the engine is hot. Alright, so it's now the next day with this uh, Dodge Caliber. If we get a better look at the rotors, let's see how uh, rusty and crusty they are. 
Uh, the customer did turn down the rotors. They said it's not in the budget and they want me to just put the pads on it. Well, at this point, I can't guarantee any uneven wear, unwanted noise, or anything like that. So, told me to slap them on and that's what I did. Um, I did have to sandblast the bracket to get as much rust off where the pads ride so everything fits nicely now. And of course, they got the cheapest pads from AutoZone, so no hardware kit. Had to reuse the old hardware kit, a lot of cleaning involved. And I've had the car running for about 30 minutes. I put water in the cooling system. The car is up to temperature. And there's no drips, no leaks of water underneath the car. So I don't know where uh, this leak is at that's causing the car to overheat. Here I am on the right side of the car. And you can actually see like, scratches in the rotor from uh, the pad. It is touching metal on metal. And look at the taper on the brake pads. Let's see if we can see this. Okay. In the back pad you can see it's thin on top, it gets thicker as you go down. In the front pad it's opposite, it's a little bit thicker at top and then as you get to the bottom it's pretty much metal on metal. But again, owner does not want to replace rotors. Alrighty then.